Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the fourth webinar for the Transport Edge Initiative. This time we are welcomed by our partners with the Department for Transport and we'll be talking about digital traffic regulation orders. Um, it's been an absolute overwhelming amount of people registered for this event and uh, looking forward to hosting some more in the future with some interesting themes such as uh, Innovation Nation, uh, Active Travel and Decarbonisation. Um, so with that I will pass over to our host for the day uh, which is Mr Graham Hansen from Department of Transport. So Graham, over to you. Thanks, Tom, and good morning, everybody, and a very well welcome to this TDI webinar on digital traffic regulation orders. For those of you who do not know me, I'm Glenn Hansen, Head of Smarter Traffic Management at the Department for Transport. Um, so I, I do know where I work, and, and I'm also the project owner for the, this, the Traffic Regulation Order Data Model Alpha. As Tom said, I recently chaired the TDI National Parking Platform, which had an audience of over 100, which I thought was really impressive. Today we have registrations from nearly 400, which is amazing, and which emphasises the importance and interest in digitising traffic regulation orders. So my team's focus is on delivering a, a traffic management system, a traffic management system that evolves with technology and advocates data sharing. And traffic regulation orders, better known as TROs to its friends, are, are a bedrock, a bedrock of traffic management. And I know most of you will know, but TROs are made under the Road Traffic Regulation Act 1984, and they set and enforce rules for use of the road for both moving traffic and static traffic regulations like parking and loading restrictions. But if we want a, a digital highway network, which my team are working towards, where operations and services are enhanced and improved by the the exchange of real-time data, I believe it is obvious that we need local authorities to publish standardised and open TRO data to anyone to access, use and share. But again, as most of you know, current legal TROs are paper-based, process-heavy, costly, and we found that TRO data provision is inconsistent and non-standardised. This makes any market operation nigh impossible trying to coordinate and access data with several hundred order making authorities nationally. So turning this on its head, we believe that digitising TROs and providing a national standard would have many advantages. It would support new services, digital mapping and the digital infrastructure for connected and aut automated vehicles. SatNav and digital map providers are key data customers who need to report changes, including temporary and permanent road closures to road users digitally and most importantly in real time. Clearly this information will be essential for ensuring cabs can safely navigate our road network. So that brings us why we're here today to explain the, prob the problems that the departments are addressing and some of the work we've undertaken so far. The solutions have been shaped by user engagement and user need. One key finding which is apparent today is the appetite for engagement and for information, especially from local authorities when discussing digitising TROs. And we've already undertaken significant user research. Uh, I suspect that many of you from the local authorities attending today have either responded to surveys or been engaged, whether by survey or interview. In addition to our current alpha research, we've undertaken a previous TRO discovery in partnership with GeoPlace and the British Parking Association and the TRO Policy Alpha. Confusing, I know, but this previous alpha set up recommendations for streamlining the TRO legislative process. So watch your space. There could be some significant announcements from the department later this year. We've also developed and validated a draft TRO data model to enable local authorities to test the publication of standardised and open TRO data. The alpha research we're discussing today provides the next stage technical solution known as the TRO data model alpha towards developing a TRO data publication and distribution system, a system which is flexible and open and builds on the proof of concept TRO data model, an end-to-end -end system determined by iterative testing, optioneering, supported by market testing and prototyping, with possible consideration of a centralised system that allows higher authorities to record the TROs for access. 
Further, we need a more flexible TRO model that can consider data throughout the TRO processes stages. And fundamentally, we need to maximise the opportunity for the existing and future software providers to support our role. And now, without further ado, I'll hand over to my colleague Andy Graham, who will provide more background and context as to why we're developing a national framework for digitising TROs. Andy is currently working for Valtech, a consultant delivering the TRO model data alpha, and he has significant experience in parking, connected vehicles, and a wide range of local authority data projects. Mr. Graham, over to you. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Thanks very much Graham. Um, so here's just what we're going to do on this discussion today. Uh, Graham's already done an intro. Um, for those of you who don't know about TROs and why they're important, I hope to show that and, and then talk about some of the benefits to a local authority. Um, and one of the keystones of our work is not to reinvent the wheel and to build on, on what's already been done. So we've asked uh, colleagues from Appyway, Buchanan and One Network um, to talk about the services that they already do in digital TROs, which we aim to build on. And my colleague, Alan Kennedy, Kennedy is a data modeler. We'll talk about the data modeling that's been done, uh, reflecting the, the TDI's interest. And then we've got some uh, a brief where next and then some Q&A. So, um, I'd like to do is to just sort of remind you that, as Graham said, it's the legal uh, mechanism to use changes. They define speed, height, weight limits, parking restrictions, but also very recently been used for changes to road layouts, such as due to COVID. Um, but they also uh, mean for road closures, for example, for roadworks, but also things as diverse as street parties. The key thing is it's the law, it's not advice, it's not like a sat-nav guidance um, and it needs to have teeth, it needs to stand up in court and the TPT, the penalty tribunal, needs for enforcement and whatever. It's the basis by which road law works. Um, there are three main types, the permanent ones, temporary ones and experimental ones. Uh, I could go into loads of detail about um, subtypes and different notices and whatever, but it's a fairly a uh, complicated landscape at the moment. Um, but many of you will be aware that Street Manager, which the DFT has launched in the last couple of years, uh, already deals with permits to work uh, on the roads. Now, not all permits close the road and not all road closures have permits, but clearly there's a, there's a relationship there. And so Street Manager and the path that it's taken, the benefits and how to engage with the community have, have really informed our, our work. Um, so by talking to people, we know about a few problems that TROs occur and many of you will be aware of this, but I just want to go through um, that it, data is difficult and time consuming to access, it has to be cleaned up and it has to be processed. And that's by everyone in the chain, be they Google or SatNav provider or a utility. Um, there's not a standardised machine readable format. Um, and when often when you say if you do a digital copy of that, a scanned PDF of a piece of paper isn't a digital copy. There's no central point of access. Um, TPT has got a, a bank of TROs for parking, but not for TTROs. Um, we spoke to people like here who make maps and TomTom. Tom, they have to collect TRO data manually. They, they get newspapers to do that. Um, and the current process for amending and implementing a TRO is labour intensive. It takes time and money uh, and it's costly. And at the moment it, it needs to generate a piece of paper with a wax seal. Um, the local paper adverts that are required by law um, until recently recent change for the experimental ones cost around £49 million a year. Um, utilities have multiple forms that they need to fill in for different local authorities for essentially the same thing and varied costs for applying for a TRO. Uh, and this results in at the very least a paper legal document which often doesn't have a map or even coordinates locations are described in, in word format. So um, they're not suitable for connected and at this point I pause uh, and automated vehicles when they come along, but they also don't suitable for curb management um, services that we'll hear about, for smart parking, for better navigation, for delivering your Amazon uh, to the last mile in a, in a world where everything is being delivered dynamically, just um, not just drones and stuff, but white vans as well. Uh, the future of intelligent speed adaptation, if we have it, etc., etc. I could go on, um, but there are other challenges that TROs on the street don't don't match the TROs that are on paper because human beings put them in at four o'clock in the rain by painting lines or putting signs up, uh, and there is a wide spectrum of storage. So um, we'll talk about uh, cloud-based later on, uh, but here's 
Uh, here's a pa an example paper one, and Alan will go into more detail about this, but this is the kind of depth that many TROs go into, some legal definitions. Um, I won't embarrass the um, local authority that stores these, but um, this is their legally binding store of TROs. It's a, it's a battered old box file. Uh, now we compare that to what we'll see later on in terms of accessibility and so on, but f for many local authorities, that's unfortunately the state of the art. Um, so in looking ahead, uh, people say, particularly in the automotive world, oh, that's all right, our vehicles just read signs. We don't need a digital thing. We can just read those. Uh, that's fine. That particular sign is bent round from uh, 180 degrees from where it should be because it's been hit by something. There's uh, signs that are in the wrong place. There's a fuzzy definition. We'll come on to some of that. There's the spirit of the sign. Uh, there's missing signs and um, I'm thinking of opening a business that will sell false 20 mile an hour signs so I can get some cars to speed outside my house. Um, we need rules for computers, for connected vehicles and autonomous vehicles uh, and they need to be um, really lying up with the order and, and there's not a hint in the word order, it's the law. Um, signs are often placed where there's a pole existing for speed speed limits. Um, signs aren't designed for cameras to understand, they're designed for human beings' eyes. Uh, and it can be hard enough for human beings to, to, to read signs. Let me give you a few examples just to liven this up. Um, so uh, you're driving along in a, a truck with a camera and it's got to work through that, all those 16 and a half tonnes and what's banned and what's not banned and so on and so forth. Um, you and I could probably just work out roughly the spirit of that sign, but but a, a camera might not be able to work out all the detail there. Uh, similarly, here's another one where uh, if you're seven and a half tons, you not allowed to turn right unless you're 14 foot and nine over, but you can't go straight on if you're 14 foot and nine over. So, uh, you know, there's a whole load of stuff like this, which just means that we just can't rely on cameras at the road. And my uh, my PS does existence is uh, what's sunset and sunrise and uh, more importantly, why is that two way street driving on the wrong side of the road? Um, answers on a postcode to that one, please. These are kind of jolly to try and liven up the talk a bit, but you see the kind of problems that we face day in and day out on the on the roadside. Um, so we have a vision for a future of TROs and that's very much about data. And what we think is that there would need to be one digital model that suits all the various types of, of digital TRO, all the various use cases and all the various users. So one, one place that has everything in it that's in a TRO and one place for finding them. That if you're a utility and you want to apply for a TTRO for a road closure, it's quick, it's consistent, and it doesn't uh, cost you money that you might have to pass on either to a taxpayer or if you're a utility to a bill payer. Um, we think that orders should be able to be made without um, unnecessary bureaucracy and so that you can manage your network using TROs as a tool rather than as paperwork. Um, we think that consultees and others who be affected by changes, so logistics people for example, are more aware and advanced of changes that will affect them and know how to contribute to TROs where they can. So for example if um, a TRO is coming online the map makers for sat navs can have that lined up rather than it being um, suddenly put on there. Uh, the people who we spoke to who produce sat nav and smart parking and all those kind of stuff, they want high quality, accurate, timely information. So it's no good saying that the road might be closed sometime in the next 18 months. They want to know when it is closed and also equally importantly when it leaves. Um, and there's some good benefits from that, but there's also some good work that's been started on that. Um, and the whole thing about timeliness and accurate comes up time and time and time again, because up until now it hasn't really mattered, but it does now. Um, we think we can save money for local authorities, we can save money for utilities, we can save money for freight users, uh, but also clearly economic benefits on uh, congestion. And the UK can help deliver against the future of mobility, urban strategy, and also the region, uh, rural strategy that's out for, for discussion by making sure that this information is there um, it's, it's useful for the short term, it's useful for the medium term with connected vehicles, um, but as Graham says, it's, it's also a real prerequisite for uh, autonom autonomy. So we've given a brief by D DFT, as Graham said, there was a discovery about the policy changes and there was a, a draft uh, m data model. So we've done a study to look at a, a kind of service for publishing that by taking the existing data model that was produced, reviewed its scope, added to it, um, added some more features to it 
um, and Alan will talk you about that later on because many of you be interested in the data side. But we've also looked at ways to deploy that model, uh, basically using as much of the existing market and local authority capabilities as we can. Um, we're working out the costs and benefits of doing that. Um, how would all this be delivered? How would it change? How would it um, transition from what we've got at the moment? Where would it need to aim to? Uh, and then we'd recommend a, a beta where we would build some of this and test it out with hopefully with many of you who are listening to this um, discussion. Um, so what we can build on, so our key principle is not to ask uh, local authorities who are currently digitising their TROs to go and buy, reinvest anything. So we've got to build on what's there. Um, we think that there are lots of benefits that were could to a local authority. So, for example, enabling easier consultation through digital means um, and moving away perhaps from the newspapers that we have now, but also in reducing the time to draft a TRO, reducing the time to uh, re produce it, the time to publish it, all that kind of stuff. Um, we've had a lot of discussion with uh, players in the current TRO market, but also people who uh, might want to move into it about how they could adapt to the new model that we're developing and publish using it. And um, hopefully the three gentlemen that will follow will show you that. Um, you'll be asking, so what? What does it all look like? The, the answer is that a lot of this is still being finalised, but what I can tell you is that data will be available from one central point in the standard data model via an API. So those people who wish to suck data out, so sat nav providers, autonomous vehicles, connected vehicles, parking providers, if you want to find out what's happening on your other local authority, etc. Um, the how we're doing that is worked on and obviously be subject to consultation. Um, but one thing we well, is very, very clear is that we'd we'll be using map based coordinates for TROs so that we don't have to describe them in a textual format that can't be used downstream and that would we'll be very much supporting emerging standards that are coming out for uh, map base map bases for autonomous vehicles uh, and for the future of uh, future of travel. So uh, on that point, I'm going to hand back to Graham. Um, and we're now going to hear from what the what the market can provide. So thank you very much. I hand you back to Graham. Thanks, Andy. Um, as Andy said, we're, we're pleased that the three main software providers, Appyway, Buchanan, Computing, and OneNet, have joined us today. Provided a quick snapshot of how their products could, can and will support the, our TRO digitisation. First up, can I welcome Ben Boucher West, Ben? Ben is head of Mobility Appy Way, known to many of you, I suspect, but as an SME in the curbside management space, pioneering traffic regulation or digitization. I can't say digitization, honestly. OK, Ben. Andy, thank you. And uh, it's Graham, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. I hope you can all see my slides. If we could just confirm that. Um, so Ben Boucher West from the app. Happy way. Uh, we are a curbside management company. As you've heard a lot around the future of the digital traffic regulation order, we're primarily concerned with parking and the relationship between parking and EV charging, the relationship to parking, loading, and all of the sort of use cases that we see happening at the curbside. We're huge advocates for all of the work that's gone on, both in the Project Alpha and, and all the work that's going on behind the scenes through the BPA, the DFT, and many of the, the partners on this call uh, to turn the curbside into an asset to empower local authorities uh, and really bring this, this data to life inside the range of use cases that Andy Graham kindly sort of touched on there. So briefly, two slides here, just showing sort of what we do and who we are. Um, we have a desktop tool designed explicitly for the creation and the maintenance of digital traffic regulation orders. Uh, so we've been in parking nearly a decade now, and this tool is specifically designed from all of that learning uh, to help those local authorities move from paper based orders, move away from the lever arch file and embrace the sort of you know, the desktop digital tools and services uh, to create a digital twin of parking and how it's run across their jurisdiction. Um, and this is a tremendously powerful. It's really built with the user experience in mind. It's very intuitive to use and within sort of 30, 40 minutes, some of our early adopters have been been live and affecting change across the network. On from that, it is explicitly designed with connections into both other public sector departments, uh, planning, highways, whoever they may be, but also importantly into the private sector. And this is where we see this data has a huge, huge value. 
Um, so the tool, as I said, very intuitive to use, tremendously good at unlocking efficiencies or, or let's say lack of efficiencies in the existing systems uh, that some of our, our clients and partners are, are suffering uh, and is really designed to bring this data to life in a way that is, is really usable for, for a whole host of sectors. As you can see, Mapper was born out of an Innovate UK project with a, a couple of key badges here on, on the wall and also just the opportunity to thank the DFT for their support in uh, you know, the promotion of this program and getting it into the hands of day-to-day of -day parking managers and, and users. It also has some private applications you might start to think about and planning an EV network across a local authority. I'd like to think about putting in charge points, where will they be? Uh, there's a whole range of things that we can do uh, with this desktop tool. Be delighted to talk to people afterwards if, you, if you'd like a demonstration of that tool. But why? What does this all mean and where does the value, where does my particular interest lie in terms of the business case out of the private sector? Um, we now have a digital curbside map of Britain. We have over 560 towns and cities uh, surveyed uh, or commissioned by ourselves uh, with the controlled parking zones right across those towns and cities. So we started in London in 2013 and that's now been built out nationally. To that end, we hope it sort of stands testament to an example of what a single data set, what a single API for the curbside map of Britain might look like. And we're working with all, all the partners here to, to try and give our own insight, but also take the learnings as part of the, the shared and open community that we're looking to promote here. Um, this data then via an API can be ingested really by anybody who's digitally enabled. You may be an app on the move, you may be a navigation system, you may be a transport planner, a consultant, some sort of infrastructure using sort of other desktop or GIS based tools. Key is this data via an API, you're looking at the curbside map of Britain. And one of the job, job cards here you can see here is actually from one of our recent fleet customers. So we're now using the traffic regulation order in a digital format to inform the delivery schedule uh, of a major logistics company. To put simply, there's two things they can see with our view of the world. One is cheapest, nearest parking to the job. You can imagine if you're a plumber or an electrician fleet, that has the potential to save you, you know, tens, if not hundreds of pounds over, over a trading month. Certainly across London, where we see different sides of the street with huge difference in charges attached. The other side then is the softer factors, but no less important. Driver well-being. Can you now park close to the job? What if you're carrying tools or equipment? Also, which side of the vehicle or side of the street to park on if you're delivering parcels, avoiding having to move in the traffic flow, uh, potentially cross complex junctions and things like that. And importantly, how long can you stay? If you think it's a two hour job, we can tune the API to show you parking that supports roughly that two hour window. We can prompt you that your session is about to you know, expire. Uh, and there's a range of sort of user aids that we can provide. Increasingly, we're getting heavily involved now in the relationship between parking and EV charging, which I won't go into now, but we recognize them as two very different activities with strong dependencies on each other. Again, another use case for the API here. Um, so really delighted to show you some of this. There's a lot we can we can offer. Happy to engage in the in the community here and do reach out to me if you've got any specific questions on anything that you've seen today and looking forward to the rest of the content. Thank you for your time. Great, thanks, Ben. Um, the, the next presentation is from Alex Smith, the Managing Director at Buchanan Computing. Alex has over 20 years experience in the parking and transportation sector and Buchanan provides a park map application, which I expect is known to many of you. Alex. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so let me just make sure the screen. So hopefully you can see that because I can't see whether or not you can. Can someone confirm that's on the screen? Yep. Yep, brilliant, thanks. Okay, so just to start off basically as a company we've you know like many others we're keen advocates on you know digital representation of traffic orders and with over 110 local authorities licensed to use part map of which 75 are currently using our latest cloud service we very much sort of welcome and appreciate the need for greater standardization and as such over the last two years we've also sort of assisted the dft and others in the development and evaluation of uh, data models for traffic regulation orders and the different projects that Graham's mentioned. And this has actually fed in also to the way we've actually developed our PartMap cloud service, which I'll outline for you uh, over the next couple of minutes. So everything I'm going to show you 
relates to part map 7's cloud service available now and is 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 there so here you can see just a simple screenshot that you can see a mixture of both static and moving traffic orders and you can see that they can be identified with different colors different labels uh, and different ways of representing labels as well such as for, for signs etc so <clears throat> You look at this, everything here is geospatially referenced and you can look at it and think, well, you know, here we are. This is what we want. This is where we are. But it's also important to understand from you know, what was said previously, this is not a digital. This is not a digital traffic order. This is a digital representation that can be used to create a traffic order from. Now, central to the way Parkmap works and us, our ethos as a company is that the idea is that you input for data quality you try to input data once and use it for the entire life cycle and everything associated with it and again that's from a data quality point of view so even from the stage of carrying out the initial consultations uh, and consulting with people doing the plans doing different different scenarios etc through to uh, the way those orders are actually described. Yes, some people, a large number of our users, probably about a third of them, still use text-based descriptions of where the restrictions are. But the other two thirds do now use maps, but they are obviously printed out as paper documents. But because we're dealing with a whole host of different local authorities who are separate legal entities, they have interpreted uh, legislation in their own way because they are the ones who are sort of the, the legal, legally responsible for the generation of those orders. So the same data can be represented and described in different ways and also different aspects of traffic orders such as speed orders may be presented differently to static orders. So but it isn't all just about the creation as being mentioned of just the traffic order itself. There are associated with it the signs and lines and these themselves are required from the legal enforcement side but aren't necessarily a requirement of writing a traffic order or producing a traffic order and they're quite complicated as has already been discussed over times dates zones etc and similarly with the lining there's linings associated with traffic orders but there's also other traffic controls which may not be associated with traffic orders such as school key clears and the standard sort of white lining that, that goes on so all of this is basically as you're building up your traffic order you're generating all of these other data sets tied into it from a single point of entry so it's just worth a, a little men mention here as well as I say. So whilst you've got the geometry and you've got the data there to actually make uh, your traffic order and give a digital representation of it, the sort of the context behind it is you've got all these different local authorities, different local authorities working in slightly different ways. And we sort of really recognise the need that of Graham and his team that the work that they've done is being pivotal and actually creating a standardisation sort of uh, framework which is required I feel for the future for you know cabs etc and as a company we've sort of embraced this and adopted this with quite a lot of enthusiasm and actually put this into practice and built it into our part map 7 system so we have also an, an open API service and how that basically means is that all of those different authorities can do things and represent their traffic orders in slightly different ways. So whether it's in Glasgow, Carlisle, Leeds, Cardiff, Hounslow or Colchester, basically they can do things in their way that they're currently doing, but present the data in a standardised way to make it accessible to, to all. So, for example, this is an area, a little area in Colchester, but you look at it and you've got different consumers need that data in different ways. So the base mapping, the underlying mapping and map projection may need to change. But the data and the context should be the same. And similarly, there are things like APDS data standard for sharing parking data, et cetera, or TROD. Then different people are accessing that data. But importantly, all the different inputs may be uh, slightly different and done in slightly different colors and styles etc but it's actually being served up in a uniform uniform manner so the idea 
also, you know, to take that on is then to make that data freely and openly available to people. So here we've written a plugin for QGIS, for example, which then takes that data, brings it in with other uh, developments and other plugins that people have written for freebie, 3D building uh, structures and drapes it and combines it all together. And again, that makes it usable in other parts of the area. So as a company, we've sort of committed basically to running this API service uh, for the next five years for all of our users. And also we'd be very happy to take data in either TROD or APDS format and actually hold that data on behalf of anyone else as well and provide that either through to a centralized DFT system or make that freely available to, to other people to, to use as well. But importantly, we're not going here and saying we own the data we recognize the original owners of the data still own that data. What we're providing is a service and a facility to share that data. So sort of finally really is what we also advocate is an evolution, not a revolution, is taking what we've got and evolving it and making it fit for both now and future's needs. I think sometimes a sort of concept of revolutions are more appealing, but as there's a sort of famous historical quote, I think is a revolution is a 360 degree about turn. You're left with the same sort of problems, but you're dizzier. So anyway, so that's it basically. <laughs> OK, thank you. Graham. Great. Thank you. great. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. Um, so next kind of presents James Harris, the CEO of One Network. James started what was then called Elgin and has grown the business into a major tech provider to the highway sector. James, over to you, please. Thanks very much, Graham, and uh, thank you to Graham and his team um, for uh, inviting us to participate in this event and to Valtech and to uh, Tom and his team as well at TDI. We've long been uh, supporters of the TDI events. They're always great and uh, we try and attend attend uh, them all, but not uh, usually as a speaker. So very grateful for that. I think as an organization, One Network is probably known to the majority of um, attendees on this event, uh, but, but we're possibly more widely known as Elgin, and we've recently uh, changed our, our name to the same name as our platform, which is One Network. So um, we are one and the same thing. Uh, but we're trying to uh, um, sort of re-educate um, our customers and our, our, our large community of users um, to use our, our new name One Network. So that, that's who we are. Um, you've heard from Appy and Buchanan about permanent TROs. Well, we exist to serve local authorities and highway authorities more generally um, to manage, coordinate and um, in every way improve the problem of temporary disruption on the road network. And as a result of that, our platform provides a workflow application around temporary TROs. And in some ways, the state of temporary TROs is um, more advanced than permanent TROs in terms of the amount of digital information uh, that is out there and how well it's being used in the real world. So. As a, as a business, we have our origins in the 2004 Traffic Management Act. And what that did was really place a duty of care on local authorities to proactively minimize disruption. And um, in response to that, we started to pull together lots of silos of information, primarily around road and street works, but also other things like public events that have the capacity to disrupt traffic and um, alter the way traffic flows around the road network. And in doing so, we pulled together the first national view really of roadworks. Um, it was then called roadworks.org, now called One Network. And, and that really sparked, I think, the start of a digital revolution in the streetworks industry, which is a, a bold claim, but I believe it to be true. Um, and that work is obviously being continued by DFT with Street Manager and other initiatives. But we, we really started that whole digitalization change in the streetworks industry and um, we've evolved quite a lot um, over the course of um, the, our, our history. Um, we now provide services to almost every highway authority in England and Wales um, really around the planning, communication, monitoring and analysis of traffic disruption and I won't go into many aspects of that. I'm really just going to focus on 
the, um, the, the most disruptive activities, which are, are road closures. Um, there's a, an astonishing level of interest in road disruption uh, as a data set, and we have over 50,000 registered users on our platform. By and large, these are not members of the public. These are uh, 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 local authority users, uh, utility users, people from a wide variety of sort of traffic operations teams, uh, but also emergency services, logistics, etc. And they're, they're organizations generally that have an operational interest in the road network. So we've, we've built almost this sort of social network of um, operational stakeholders in, in, the, in the road network who rely on uh, the, the services that we provide to give advance warning around road disruption and more, more and more um, live information around what is happening in terms of the management of things like road closures. And from a very early stage in gathering together roadworks information, we were much more interested in the detail around the most disruptive activities. And, and what we did with the introduction of traffic management module, some people still call it traffic management app. It is an app as well, I'll come on to that. Uh, but we really took road closures out of local authority filing cabinets and put them into uh, a digital ecosystem where they could be digitally shared uh, and uh, used in a much more effective way. Uh, so if I can move on. Um, so we have uh, this, this thing called traffic management module. It's actually used uh, by 90 subscribing highway authorities, uh, which is a, a very high proportion of the market. Uh, there are further 25 currently using it for uh, COVID related uh, activities. And in fact, um, we've had um, over uh, 1900 traffic management changes logged through our system simply in response to COVID. So these are things like temporary um, uh, cycle lanes, um, pavement widening and those sorts of things. But an awful lot of them are road closures as well. So that's just just the COVID related activities. Over the last 12 months, 70,000 road closures have been planned and managed through the platform. Um, so what do we do with that data? Well, first and foremost, we push it out to our public website um, and the, the numbers here are pretty staggering. I used to joke that not all of the visitors to, to, the, to our public website could be my mum. We now have something like, well, over 400,000 visitors per month on the website, just close to 5 million a year. Um, and by and large, what, what the website is doing is providing an authoritative record from local authorities primarily to citizens, to road users about what's going on on, on, on the road. I'm very quickly going to just jump into the website itself to show you a live road closure in Kent um, and how Kent are using this from the point of view of managing TTROs. So what traffic management module enables you to do is to plan the detail of the road closure and the associated diversion route, but also to generate a uh, notice document from that automatically. So here we have the public notice that's being generated. And on our website, we have thousands and thousands and thousands of these things. So if I zoom out a little bit, you can just see this is just road closures and associated Sorry, James, diversion the routes. Presentation at the moment, we haven't got the website up. Oh, I beg your pardon. OK, um, that may be something I can fix. Um, we should have practiced this, beg your pardon. Just bear with me a sec. So if I stop sharing and share again, I hope this will share the desktop. Screen one. We are getting a little bit pushed for time as well, uh, I think. Are you, seeing, are you seeing my screen again? It is there, James, yeah, crack on. Yeah, OK, so um, this is just a very quick view of uh, road closures and associated diversion routes that are currently taking place in the county of Kent. And each one of these has its uh, temporary traffic reg regulation order, both the made order and the public notice generated automatically through the application. You can imagine the, the level of savings um, and efficiency gains um, that um, can be realized through that. So if I flip back to the presentation just very quickly, are you still seeing my screen? Are you still seeing the presentation? Yes, they're on the website at the moment, James, still. OK, let me just. Share that again, OK, so just very quickly, um, 
So in addition to pushing the information out to the public via the One Network public website, we also use um, real-time technology to push um, those road closures that are being managed in real time on the road network live to uh, our partners in the SatNav space. So Google here, uh, TomTom and Waze, and some of those organizations that are actually updating their navigation algorithms in real time. So the benefit of that is instant communication to the public. We had over 5,000 real time road closures going through our platform in the last year, and that number is set to increase radically as we include uh, data from smart infrastructure like uh, intelligent cones and, and that sort of thing as well. Uh, we have a, uh, a roadside app where um, both utility contractors and local authority contractors can effectively play Google God and um, authoritatively um, the, update a road closure and allow that to then be passed uh, in real time through to uh, sat, sat navs and to enable um, the driving public to um, uh, alter their journeys in response to that. And that's an incredibly powerful and important thing. Incidentally, this feed to sat navs includes a lot of things that aren't formally covered by TTROs as well. So it's actually a, 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 a richer data set that allows the, uh, the, the road authority to effectively directly communicate with drivers. And then finally, um, we, Sorry, we, James, we, we're just going to have to cut you there. Unfortunately, we need to just crack on if that's OK. OK, uh, Graham, thanks. just over to you. Sorry, James. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Tom. And thanks, James. Um, OK, so just changing subject matter a little now, we'll, let's revert back to the alpha we've been talking about and the development work that Valtech has done. So I'm pleased to present the next speaker, who is Alan Kennedy, who is a specialist data model at Valtech. Alan, over to you, please. Thank you very much, Graham. I'm just going to share my screen. It was there, Alan, it's just disappeared. Do you want to send it again? OK. So you can see the, that a TRO has defined terms. Yep, you're all good. Yep. OK, well, it's been pointed out there's a great diversity of practice in the um, creation and making of TROs, uh, but what they all have in common is their nature as legal documents. So therefore, TROs typically have defined terms. They have articles. And they have schedules. So therefore, from that aspect of TROs, a data model focusing on that aspect will point out that a TRO document is composed of a number of elements. And an element can be either a defined term, an article or a schedule. An article may reference the schedule. An article may reference a number of defined terms. And of course, there are dependencies on overarching legislation, primary and secondary legislation. But it's not the purpose of a TRO to assemble large quantities of legalese. A TRO will define provisions. It will define exemptions to those provisions. It will define permitted purposes and vehicle usage. Regulated periods, Schedule 502, um, specifies a Monday to Saturday recurring uh, daily period. And it'll specify regulated places where the provisions are applicable. So therefore, oh, by the way, uh, that's the place that's being referred to approximately. And I'm rather hoping that none of you listening are recognizing your local co-op and favorite chippy. So what did we what did we see in that uh, sample TRO? We saw that there were provisions which apply to one or more regulated places. Now this model doesn't go into detail about place, but it can be as fine grained as you need an individual curbside parking bay. It can be as complex as you need, you know, the entire um, area covered by a local highways authority. 
So a provision applicable to a single place is a regulation. Broadly speaking, regulations fall into three primary types, movement, parking and access. Movement, covering speed limits and manoeuvres. And the conceptualization of a regulation is that it is specifying a constraint on vehicle behaviour. A regulation is applicable during a, a regulated time period. These are, this, this is a notion that's well um, elaborated in existing standards, but we've seen in our sample TRO the idea of a recurring daily period and the idea of a continuous 24 hour period. Exemptions um, define types of vehicle which are exempted during a regulated time period for specified permitted purposes. A vehicle which is deemed to be of an exempt type will be determined to be so because of characteristics it possesses and possibly its driver possesses. Physical characteristics, length, height, weight, emission type, payload characteristics, dangerous or not, operational usage, police, fire, ambulance, etc, etc, parking permits and so on and so forth. So therefore, with that in mind, we could say that a police car is not bound by a regulation constraining access to a bus lane, provided that its purpose at the time was responding to an emergency. It wouldn't have access to a bus lane if its purpose at the time was collecting lunch from the co-op. So digital TROs will be much more precise about place. Whatever tooling you're using for drafting, mapping and consultation at the moment, um, we'll need map based coordinates from them. And ideally correlated with um, a road network model of which two are illustrated here. Together with potentially um, measures and offsets which help us understand precisely where your ro the road will be dug up in accordance with a permit and temporary TRO. That's not to say that ordinary language descriptions of place are not useful for human readers and, and will still no doubt find a way into a published form of digital TRO. There were three pages of um, defined terms in the sample TRO. But there's no reason why there can't be a standardised glossary of defined terms defined nationally and cross referenced once and for all to defining legislation. And they might be rendered in a digital TRO as hyperlinks, uh, Wikipedia style, so that you can just pop up the definition if you're really interested. Incidentally, of the defined terms in the sample TRO that I showed you at the beginning, two thirds of those defined terms are not referenced in the document. As the second fragment of data model I illustrated suggests, regulated periods of exemptions can be boiled down just to data. And that would uh, result in eliminating substantial quantities of repetitive and potentially contradictory text. And in a digital TRO, the exemptions and regulated periods simply appear as a data table. I might add that in the sample TRO, Two articles, which between them occupied three pages of text, actually had identical text in them, 100% redundant. And a third article specifying the loading and unloading exemptions actually introduced a contradiction. So the, the TRO therefore was effectively meaningless. So digital TROs are probably a good idea. And the alpha data model is intended to accommodate the current diversity of practice, but by offering a harmonised semantics of TROs, will 
With support from the major players from whom you've heard today, start an evolution towards a single shared set of DTRO best practice. And there we are. I hope that's been helpful. And um, now hand you back to Graham. Great. Thank, thanks, Alan. Um, OK, so we have 10 minutes left and, and I believe there's been quite a lot of interest in the in the question uh, session. I'll, I'll hand you back over probably to Tom and, uh, and Andy to, to just run through how we're going to manage the questions. I, I will add that we've been thankfully joined by Sally Kendall, who is head of Streetworks Policy and Regulation and responsible for TRO policy at DFT. Uh, and I will thankfully back up uh, my responses in the, in the Q&A session. Andy, how are we going to manage this session? Fine. Um, so firstly, thanks for all your questions. Um, some of them are specific to um, suppliers, so we'll take those ones offline. Uh, some of them are uh, very specific about definitions of TROs and, and so on and so forth. And I think we'll just leave you to read those. Um, some of the questions are about the policy, which is going to be out for consultation. So um, I think it would be a bit inappropriate to preempt that. So what we're trying to try and do in the nine minutes we've got left is to focus on some of the more data orientated uh, questions uh, and then perhaps uh, some of the ones where we can discuss uh, around the policy side. Um, the one that's uh, been um, questioned about the central database interrogated by third parties, public to see details of TRO and a plan of the area affected. That's very much true. I think one of the things we'd just like to highlight is that we aren't producing maps in a digital TRO. We're producing the coordinates of the thing that would be drawn on a map and therefore it's map agnostic. Uh, so a question somebody had about open base maps. Yes, it could certainly draw it on top of open street maps. Um, so I think that's the, the question about the central database covered. Um, there's lots of questions about publishing a DTR and, and local newspapers. Again, that's tied up with the policy consultation as indeed questions about um, uh, the, the change in law. Um, Graham and Sally, do you want to cover anything about about where funding might might be coming from? Sorry for funding. So for the what? question is, uh, what consideration regards to funding can be expected to converting non-digital TROs to digital? Sally, do you want to give us a hand with that? Because that obviously feeds into some of the wider TRO policy stuff. Hi, yes, I think is, is that probably more a question of the archive, perhaps? I think so, yeah. Orders? Yeah, um, hi everyone. Um, yeah, so the, the work that we're doing at the moment uh, uh, and whatever solution uh, you know might come out of this, I think initially we will we'll look at sort of implementing for new orders or changed orders. Um, as, as people note, there's a huge archive out there of historic traffic orders, but it's not just as simple as converting them into a digital format. Some of the information itself as well needs clarifying. So. Uh, it may be something that we can come back to down the line that there's sort of no, no, no decisions taken at the moment on, on how we deal with the archive. We're sort of looking at sort of from now onwards. Great, thank you very much. OK, so another question is about um, accessibility requirements for TROs. Maps with coloured lines are well and good unless you have some form of vision impairment or text based explanations still required. I think Alan covered that in terms of converting coordinates into text. Um, so I think we are very much on, on board with that one. Uh, another question was about TROs be linked to the National Street Gazetteer. So uh, Alan has done a large amount of work looking at potential linkages across to map bases. Uh, one's from Tony Kane. Um, uh, someone anonymous said, uh, what could be the implications for those local authorities with their TROs mapped already? I think we'd like to show that those of you who've already invested in uh, the supplier systems here or developed your own system or uh, got some uh, other thing from the marketplace that we're building on that. Um, there may be small additional bits of data that will be in a digital TRO that aren't in your existing one and you've, some of the discussions have been highlighting that. Um, but certainly we would be wanting uh, your investment to be built on rather than negated. Um, uh, discussion about public rights of way and what mapping could be done for adding public rights of way, footpaths and so on. 
Um, we've certainly been looking at that because obviously with things such as um, off street parking and so on, that starts becoming important. So we've taken that one on board. So Chloe and somebody else asked that one. Uh, Peter Lee, is there a need or benefit to develop international standards in this space? Um, so Peter, we've got John Harrow Booth on the team, who I think you know is uh, very strong in that area. Uh, one of the things that we're trying to make sure is that global providers such as Google, here, TomTom Tom can access our data and we spent a lot of time there, uh, but also for, um, as you say, for innovators to export their, their services and we've heard from three of those today. Um, public consultation and um, uh, moving away from paper processing, I think we've covered that one. Um, and the, the question about open data and, and uh, open data, uh, I think has been covered. Um, what we've decided try to do is make this agnostic to any map base and agnostic to any um, formal processing. Um, the question about the uh, manual publishing of TRO to be around for a long time yet. Sally, did you want to discuss about about the kind of time timing and, and process of, of transition? Um, yes, yeah, it's about advertising our. So somebody said um, for all sorts of reasons, I expect the manual publishing of TROs to be around for a while yet, but for a long time. Uh, so we've mentioned a consultation, a policy consultation that is due out later this year. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Um, it's just being agreed with ministers at the moment across government what approach we'll, we'll take to that. Uh, but we do want to consult on some amendments to both secondary and primary legislation. Uh, the secondary legislation could in theory take 12 months or so and then there'd be an implementation period. The primary would take a little bit longer because we need to find a, a slot in Parliament to take that through. Uh, but it's certainly what we're actively looking at. Uh, I don't know if people saw a Policy Alpha research report that we published last year. Uh, if you type in TRO Policy Alpha, it's the first link that comes up on the uh, on the Gov website. Um, that will give you some hints about what we want to consult on. Uh, but uh, yeah, obviously work's going ongoing, but it will take us another year or two, I think, to get to where ideally we'd like to be in terms of the legislation. Great, thank you very much, Sally. I'm just conscious that we've, uh, we're running out of time. So we will look at all these questions. Some of the questions are actually causing me to scratch my head a little bit to make sure that our model does cover the stuff. Um, Graham, there's one from Tony Kane in Wales about DFT working with the Welsh Government to make sure consistency across England and Wales. Yeah, we, we welcome the opportunity. So um, let's say offline, but very happy to have that conversation. OK, fine. Um, so we've got two minutes left. Graham, did you want to just cover the, the next steps in where we are and um, uh, and what we're going to be doing in the, in the, in the short and long term? Yeah, with pleasure. Well, but for thanks, everybody. And thanks, everybody, for the contribution today. Another really successful TDI webinar. I'm really grateful for everybody's support and for the speakers who have all provided really clear information about how we digitise TRO and how the market will support that. The next, obviously, of our next process is to complete the alpha process we are going through. Um, we will need to take some time and, and effort to reflect on what has been provided. We will then go to a, the next stage development, which is beta, which is full scale testing of the model and, and uh, potential legislative framework to support that. And as Sally said, there's, there is potentially a lot of announcement coming from the DFT this year on TROs. Quite an exciting and challenging time for both Sally and I. So we really look forward to further engagement with the community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Graham. So uh, for those of you on the call who are interested in the data side and data model, do please get in touch. Um, for those of you who asked about the slides, I'm sure, Tom, you confirm that they're going to be published. Indeed, yes. So we will send all of the slides and a recording of the event um, either later this week or early next week. And then any unanswered questions, as Andy said, we'll send around to all the relevant people and, and try and get an answer for you as soon as possible. Um, but yeah, we'll try and get that out as soon as we can. Fine. So I'll hand back to Tom for the for the for the closing. Yeah, thanks, Andy. And uh, thanks, everyone. So thanks for uh, Alex, James, Sally, Graham, Ben. Uh, Alan, thank you all for um, taking a part today and taking your time to, to speak to us. It's been really interesting and uh, I'd like to think that everyone attending has had a very influential and an informative event. So with that, we say we'll look forward to seeing you again at our next event. For details, we will follow the shortly via our social medias and things like that. So for now, stay safe in these unprecedented times and uh, we will see you soon. So thanks for everyone. See you soon. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.